of the Cognitive Ontology Seminar organized by Adina Roskies and myself at the Center for Philosophy of Science Online this semester. And we're delighted to uh, have you uh, again here with us. I wanted to tell you about the event this week at the Center. Now, uh, tomorrow, Ed Slovic, uh, who is a center fellow this semester, will be talking about Kant and Ma at noon. On Friday at 3.30, uh, Professor Matt Haber from Utah will be talking about the species problem problem and the no solution solution. Um, <laughs> and you're at 3.30, you're invited to uh, join us for that uh, one hour lecture. Um, and on uh, Monday, uh, no, no, actually on Tuesday next week, Nick Centerfellow, Nick Fillon will be giving a talk. With respect to our seminar, uh, the next meeting will not be on Monday, but will be on Thursday. So uh, for the remainder of the semester, meetings will be taking place on Thursday afternoon. So please make sure to have the right time for the Cognitive Ontology Seminar. Uh, meetings. I think if you want to register, and the next speaker will be uh, Brian Bruya, who is going to end uh, uh, Ju uh, Julia Haas, and both of them will be talking at 10, 10 a.m. on October 29th, on the Thursday, October 29th. Um, if you want to register for any of these events, please go to the website of the center and you'll find the Zoom link to register for any of those talks. And I will leave you here and let Adina uh, the speaker. Okay. Thanks very much, Edward, and welcome everybody. Uh, so this is a continuation of the Cognitive Ontology speaker series, and today we're going to hear from Vincent Bergeron and Javier Gomez Lavin, or Lavin. I'm not sure what the right pronunciation is. Um, and so it's going to be a relatively international uh, meeting today. So Vincent's going to talk first. Um, he is an associate professor of philosophy at the University of Ottawa. Uh, he is truly Canadian. He was educated at McGill and UBC. Um, and his current research projects are focused on the relationship between cognitive architecture and brain architecture, the relationship between animal and human cognition, and the contribution of cognitive science to our understanding of aesthetic experience um, so today, uh, his talk is entitled Carving the Mind at its Homologous, homologous Joints. Uh, so take it away, Vincent, and uh, we'll check in again after the talk. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Adina. And thanks to all the uh, organizers for the uh, wonderful conference. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, let's see. Try to play this. All right, is it working? It is. It is, good. All right, let's start. Um, all right, um, now we know um, uh, that the human brain shares uh, many of its anatomical and functional features with uh, that of other species. Uh, so I think it's, it's safe to assume, I will assume here uh, uh, anyway, that we also share with other species um, many of the mechanisms underlying our cognitive abilities. And, and here I'm thinking even uh, what we consider to be humanly or uniquely human cognitive abilities like language, uh, okay? So now um, it's, uh, uh, it's not as clear, however, how we can exploit this cognitive continuity uh, in order to identify the components of uh, human cognitive architecture that we share with other species uh, and that have remained stable, um, I will argue, for long time, uh, long evolutionary timescales. So the proposal uh, for the talk, uh, so I'm gonna argue that a useful way to think about these shared components or building blocks is to think of them as cognitive homology. So a lot of the talk will be trying to make sense of, of that concept. Uh, so, and I'm going to argue uh, using an example towards the end uh, that the identification of cognitive homologies can be useful uh, in constructing um, cognitive ontologies that are well suited for the cognitive neurosciences. Okay, so here's the, uh, an outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, saying a few things about the notion of uh, structural or morphological uh, homology and then uh, move on to uh, uh, try to make sense of what a functional homology would look like. Um, and then uh, I'll conceive of, uh, so I'll, I'll introduce uh, cognitive homology as a functional homology in the cognitive domain. And then I'll finish with 
uh, an example. Okay, so uh, originally defined as uh, the same organ in different animals under every variety of form and function, uh, the notion of homology is traditionally understood as uh, the relationship between structures that derive from a common ancestor, regardless of how these structures are being used in different species. Um, now, there are lots of debates about how best to define homology and, and especially the best approach uh, or uh, the best approaches uh, to try to identify, uh, discover those homologies. So I'm not going to deal with that in the talk. Uh, there's a, a little bit of discussion in the paper about this, but uh, I don't have time here. Uh, but it is a hotly debated uh, concept. Now, uh, homologous uh, structures tend to share several biological properties because they derive from a common ancestor. So that includes internal organization, put, uh, position relative to other structures, uh, developmental mechanisms, and others. So here's a uh, classic example. I'm sure you've, you've heard of this before. Uh, so consider the arrangement of bones in the wings of bats and arms of human. So the top and bottom here, uh, what you see is, is exactly the same uh, bones um, and uh, the slightly different proportions, uh, especially in the hand uh, versus the, the, the tip of the wing of the bat. Um, but you know, you've got uh, about 65 million years separating uh, these two uh, species uh, from the common ancestor. Uh, and so you see the bird here as well has uh, homologous bone structures to the 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 wing uh, the wing of bat and the wing of uh, uh, of birds uh, they're not homologous um, they don't originate in a common ancestor but the 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 forelimb or the uh, the arrangement of bones is uh, okay so that's classic example I'll return to this uh, in a few minutes the so biologists think of um, <clears throat> homologs as natural units of biological organization. So the example of muscles, organs, and bones. Uh, well, comparative and anatomists, uh, they, they do the same, uh, right, for parts of the brain. So here's a side-by-side -side of the uh, macaque monkey brain and human brain. Now, uh, not all of those have been uh, clearly established as uh, homologies, but I'm going to focus in my example at the end uh, on area 44, 45, and, and, and 6 uh, you see here. Uh, so I'll return to that. All right, so uh, that's, uh, that's all I'm gonna say about uh, uh, structural homology for now. Um, let's move on to functional homology. Um, so uh, now if, uh, as we said, uh, uh, homology is the same structure regardless of form and function, then you might think, wait, wait a minute, that's, it sounds like the concept of functional homology, uh, many thought anyway, that, that was the case, I'd say it's a contradiction in term. Okay, so people have said that. Uh, but nevertheless, you see the, the, the expression functional homology um, everywhere in biology. So uh, there must be something to it. So uh, I'm gonna try to make sense of it. So here's a place to start. Um, uh, the notion of bi uh, behavioral homology in, in etology. So the, the, the classic uh, uh, account here is uh, Wenzel. Uh, he says, determining homology among behaviors uh, is no different than determining homology among morphological features or structures. Behavior is no special, it's just more difficult to characterize. And then he says, homologous behaviors are defined as those that find their origin in the same ancestor and are similar because of descent from their common ancestor. So, um, now, one thing to note here I'm not gonna talk uh, uh, or criticize or explore this concept here, but the one thing to note is that behavior, behavioral homologies as defined above uh, are not uh, or need not be tied to structural homologies. And this for two reasons. Uh, one is homologous behaviors can be based on non-homologous structures. So there's an example from uh, Strider and Northcutt uh, where uh, they discuss two grasshopper species that produce a homologous song uh, using non-homologous body parts. So that's one reason not to tie uh, the uh, behavioral, model, behavioral homologies to structural homologies. And the other reason is that homologous structures can support non-homologous behaviors. And Wenzel again says this happens when separate and non-homologous behaviors evolve to take advantage of the same uh, structural 
elements. And so think of exaptation here, it's very common. Uh, so that would be a good reason, according to this account, not to tie uh, cognitive, <clears throat> sorry, uh, behavioral homology to structural homology. But for my project, uh, it is important to tie them, especially if we want to bring or uh, build the brain into psychology, as Michael Anderson uh, put it uh, last week. Uh, if we want to do that, uh, especially for cognitive neuroscience, um, we're going to need to tie uh, the concept of functional homology to structural homology. And this is what I turn to, call it uh, functional homology two. And this is the one that I'm going to be interested in. Okay, so let's go back to that picture of uh, the arrangement of bones in the bat wings, uh, in the bat wing and the human arm. So what you have there is essentially uh, uh, the same bones uh, organized in, in the same way. Uh, uh, and, and that means that the uh, structure, the whole structure's bio, uh, biomechanical properties, right? And by this, I mean like how the bones work together uh, using homologous sets of muscles and ligaments. Um, that work, right? This, this, this work is, is very similar, right? If you think of, uh, you know, how our arm moves, uh, of course it's, you know, the bat has uh, proportionally much longer fingers uh, uh, than us, as you saw in the picture. But basically, the, 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 we can say that the, uh, the basic contribution of that, of those biomechanical properties uh, is, is, is very, very similar. Now, um, by contrast, of course, the two structures uh, is used for different, are used for completely different purposes in the two species. Think of driving versus flying. Obviously, these are very different. Uh, so, so we can try to make sense of this by saying uh, that the uses of the structure, of the bone structure, uh, the activities in which it participates have changed greatly uh, over 65 million years. Uh, but the workings, right, its workings or its basic contribution, the basic contribution it makes to these varying uh, uses have remained remarkably stable. Uh, of course, there are differences, but uh, they, they, if you think of it as the basic contribution, it's essentially uh, the same. Now, so here's, uh, uh, here comes the, the first uh, or my sort of account of functional homology, uh, the second version, uh, one in which the uh, uh, the functional homology is tied to uh, a structural homology. So I'll say that the workings of a homologous structure, uh, uh, so functional homology is the workings of a homologous structure, regardless of how these workings are being used in different species, right? Or to echo the uh, Owen's original uh, definition, we can say that this, this functional homology is the same workings in different species uh, under every variety of uses, where the same workings mean uh, the workings of homologous structures it doesn't have to be identical. I'll come back to this uh, in a minute. Um, but uh, uh, just like in the case of structural homology, the same working means that uh, they uh, are workings of homologous structures. All right. So uh, I just want to uh, <clears throat> stress the importance of making the distinction between uh, uh, the uses uh, and the workings of a, a structure, because uh, I think it has fueled some of the skepticism in the literature about the possibility of finding uh, these uh, functional homologies in the sense that I'm uh, interested in, it, and, and also uh, suspicion about the cognitive homologies that I'll be talking about later. So this is Richard Lewontin. Uh, he says, um, given the general conservation of a body plan that characterizes large group of species, the recruitment of previously existing morphological features into new function is the only path open to evolution when needs for, to, for functional novelties arise. So I, I agree with that, That's, that makes perfect sense. Uh, and he says, consequently, there uh, may be no function uh, at all in the ancestral uh, species uh, that is homologous to the function in the descendants, even though they share anatomical features. So it's true that uh, the cognitive or the, the, the functional or the use of uh, a structure will change uh, a lot with uh, things like acceptation, uh, but there remains the possibility that their workings or their basic contribution uh, might be the same, might remain uh, uh, very similar, right? So, and, and Lewontin's argument doesn't capture that. Uh, same thing happened to uh, this quote here. 
uh, Georg Streiter uh, says, current efforts to homologize brain regions across species are often motivated by the expectation that uh, functional homology uh, can be deduced from structural homology. However, this extrapolation is assumption can also impede progress because it disregards the possibility that brain regions may change their function. Any, what he means here, change their use, how they're used uh, during the course of evolution. So, um, so again, if you just put it in terms of the use, uh, the uses of a brain region or body part, uh, of course, those are gonna change and you might not find uh, homologies at that level. But there's another uh, level at which you might find uh, that uh, uh, stable, uh, uh, stable functions. And this is what I describe as uh, the workings or the basic contribution of a structure. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, move on to the uh, notion of cognitive homology. So here, um, <clears throat> as I said at the very beginning, uh, I think of cognitive homologies as uh, functional homologies in the cognitive domain. So the definition will be uh, uh, very similar. So the basic uh, cognitive homology here will be defined as the basic cognitive contribution uh, of a homologous brain structure, regardless of how this cognitive activity is being used in different species. So here, um, what's important is when I say basic, uh, cognitive contribution. So I, I say basic because the aim here is to describe the activity performed by the structure in a domain neutral uh, way as much as possible so, that, so as to capture the reusable aspect of the activity for uh, various cognitive purposes. So think of the cognitive workings of a brain region or a network of, of, of brain regions um, it can be uh, defined uh, at various levels of analysis, right? Uh, it could be psychological, computational, neural, um, and also at various uh, level of abstraction, domain specific, domain neutral, or domain general. Um, so what you try to do when it comes to cognitive homology is to, to capture the domain neutral sort of basic cognitive contribution uh, of that uh, structure. Okay, so um, now uh, I think uh, uh, it'll be clear with the example later, but I think that the basic cognitive contribution of the homologous brain structure tends to remain stable across extended evolutionary periods. So at least it is much more stable relative to uh, the cognitive uses uh, of a homologous brain structure. And so I created this little table here to, to show uh, how uh, relative to the basic contribution uh, the basic, basic cognitive contribution of the structure relative to this, how much faster the cognitive uses of that structure can change. So, so you can have the change in the cognitive uses of a structure because of a change in its direct connections to other structures, um, right? Think of different partnerships that can be created. Uh, it could be due to a change in indirect connections to other structures. So uh, the structures to which uh, it is connected might then connect to uh, uh, different structures. You can have a change in the organism's uh, uh, environment, uh, habitat. It could be a technological change. Think of the invention of writing. Uh, you've got suddenly in a short amount of time, um, uh, structures that were used for visual structures, sensory motor structures that are used for, uh, uh, that are now used for something completely novel, uh, writing, also changes to population and so on, social changes. And of course, you could have a change in how a structure is used cognitively uh, because of change in its internal organization, right? If you change what's happening in there, the kinds of operations or mechanisms that are circuits that are happening in there then might affect uh, how the thing can be used. Now, in contrast, uh, a change in the basic contribution of a structure uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, ultimately uh, in most cases will depend on uh, a change in its internal uh, organization. So for instance, the creation of uh, new neural circuits or modification of circuits. Now, there's more here that needs to be said. Uh, obviously, if you disconnect uh, a brain structure from 
uh, its uh, its partners, uh, then then you're going to change the contribution. It might not contribute to anything. Or if you sort of graft, uh, let's say, Broca's region into the visual cortex, uh, you you might uh, change. Uh, but ultimately, what's going to happen is that the internal organization, what's happening in there, will 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 change. Uh, so. Now, a change in the internal organization, I uh, just want to point this out here, uh, is not always uh, equivalent or does not always lead to a change in its basic contribution. So here's an example. Um, this is uh, Strider again. Um, he discusses this example. The differences in the internal organization of a, the nucleus uh, laminaris, uh, so uh, homologous uh, auditory region, between barn owls and chickens probably account for the barn owls' greater ability to detect uh, interaural time differences. But then he continues, he says, uh, well, the structure in both species likely plays a fundamentally similar role in sound localization. So you can have a reorganization inside the structure without a change in its basic contribution, your basic cognitive contribution. Now, an extreme example of this uh, just came out um, a few weeks ago in, in science. Um, so um, here, uh, birds have um, a, you know, exceptional cognitive abilities um, that are similar to, uh, 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 comparable to, to, to mammals. Uh, here you've got the pigeon brain and the, the rat brain, um, but their forebrain uh, is, is very different. Uh, so in mammals, you've got the, uh, the six layers uh, of cortex, and uh, which is, and the circuits are uh, fairly sophisticated, but in the, um, the, in the, in the bird uh, pallium, uh, in this case, uh, in the bird pallium, uh, it, seems, it seems to be a, a relatively simple nuclear organization. And so we've known this for, for a long time. But what this, um, what the, um, what the researchers found, uh, they found a, a canonical circuit that was comparable to uh, the one found in the mammalian cortex, and that uh, circuit exhibits uh, the similar columnal and uh, lamina-like uh, organization. So it's sort of depicted the, on the uh, on the picture here. So they hypothesized that uh, an ancient uh, microcircuit. Um, I think uh, last uh, last week Paul uh, Sisek had this uh, this uh, this uh, this graph where uh, you could see the common ancestor between the mammals and and, and the birds uh, to go back roughly 350 uh, million uh, years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so the hypothesis they hypothesized that there's an ancient microcircuit that already existed in the last common ancestor uh, and that might have been. Uh, largely conserved. Uh, anyway, so I find this fascinating. Uh, of course, uh, this is just the beginning of, of these kinds of discoveries. Okay, so I wanna uh, finish with uh, an example. Um, and uh, so that involves um, Broca's region. So, so the, the uh, homologs, of area 44 and 45. So sometimes you hear Broca's area uh, and uh, it's defined as area 44. Some people say it's 44 and 45. So in the literature, sometimes you see Broca's region uh, as uh, defined as area 44 and 45 uh, in the human brain. Now the homologs have been uh, clearly established uh, in the macaque monkey. Michael Petridis at McGill uh, did, uh, did, uh, did that work. Um, and uh, so in the macaque monkey, you see uh, at the bottom here, um, you see area 45 and 44 is, is you have to flatten that, uh, that picture, think of it as a, or that surface because area 44 is in the fold. Uh, so it's in the, uh, but it, the, the, the position relative to, to all the other areas is the same. Uh, and so I can say more about uh, the Trudy's work uh, in the Q and A. Uh, but clearly, these are homologs, um, and of course, we've long known that uh, Broca's, uh, Broca's region has a, a contribution to speech production. Uh, but more recently, maybe not so recently anymore, but more recently, uh, uh, it's been shown that uh, it's involved in a wide range of non-linguistic tasks, such as music processing, object manipulation, 
action sequencing and action perception. So we know it, 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 it's active in other domains. Uh, and it's also active in those domains in macaque monkeys uh, and other primates, not just in us. Uh, so clearly um, the, the region has been there for a long time. Uh, and so it'd be nice to figure out uh, what its basic contribution is. Um, now, it turns out that uh, the work done by Petrides and his colleagues uh, uh, suggests uh, or indicates that uh, the basic contribution of uh, the, this region has remained the same, has been uh, conserved throughout primate evolution. And this is what I wanna uh, go over uh, here. So uh, really we're talking about a, a network of homologous structures. So that comprises the sort of uh, architectonic areas, so 44, 45, and 6, which is a premotor area shown in, in light green here. Uh, and, and remember, 44 is in the fold because that's the, the macaque monkey brain. So, so 44 is really just in the fold between uh, 45B and, and 6. And so uh, what they found uh, is uh, they used the autoradiographic um, uh, method to map the precise neural connectivity of these two regions, uh, 44 and 45. And so the, uh, the, uh, the, the work shows that Broca's uh, region, right, is connected to specific areas of the temporal and parietal uh, lobe by two uh, streams of long axons, long fibers, okay? So um, you've got uh, the first one in the ventral stream in yellow, here connects the uh, uh, various areas of the temporal lobe, some auditory regions in there, uh, to mostly area 45, but also uh, uh, moderately uh, 44 as well. And you've got um, the, in red, the dorsal stream uh, and uh, made of the, uh, the superior uh, uh, longitudinal fasciculus and uh, also part of the arcuate fasciculus you see at the back. Uh, in the macaque monkey, you have a very simple arcuate fasciculus. Uh, in humans, you've got a very well-developed one, and that's the one since uh, 19th century we've known is involved in, in language uh, and speech uh, production. Right? Think of the Wernicke's model where uh, Wernicke's area is connected to Broca's area via the arcuate fasciculus. Well, there is an arcuate fasciculus in macaque monkeys, and it feeds into the longitudinal uh, fasciculus, uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus, uh, but it's much more simple. Uh, and of course, uh, monkeys don't talk, uh, so it makes perfect sense. Um, okay, so now here's um, what uh, uh, Petrides and Pandya, here's what they, how they, what they think about uh, the contribution of that area. I've got five minutes left, should be, uh, should be uh, able to do that. So there's um, uh, considerable evidence in both humans and macaque monkeys that area 45 is involved in the active, active control, uh, controlled retrieval of verbal and nonverbal information. Um, now, area 45, uh, if you remember the picture, uh, is directly connected to area 44. Um, and 44 is between 45 and 6, which is a premotor area. And 44 is also directly connected to area six. So here's, um, here's how uh, uh, Petrides and Pandya describe what might be the fundamental contribution of, of, of this network of structures. So they say area 44 is in an ideal position to mediate between strategically retrieved and selected information from posterior temporal and parietal cortex by area 45, now involving those long streams of fibers. And the articulation of such information via hand and orofacial action by the ventral precentral gyrus, so area six. So, um, so the way, so one way to, to capture this basic contribution, basic cognitive contribution of area 44 is to say that area 44 in conjunction with area six will be to uh, translate the information retrieved by adjacent area 45 into complex sequences of motor actions. And speaking is uh, 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 very much what, uh, what that is, that is assembling or putting together complex sequences of actions. But it could be done in different uh, domain as well, like gestures, uh, 
object manipulation here. Okay, so the basic contribution. So the idea here, I think, is this is a good example of what a cognitive uh, homology would look like, right? Uh, and also think of it as a as a building block. Whatever that network does, its contribution to all its various uses in different species um, could very well uh, have remained the same throughout uh, millions of years of, of, of evolution. So I want to just uh, end uh, with just uh, just concluding remarks, because the paper talks about this uh, a lot more. Um, but um, so, uh, as Michael uh, Anderson mentioned uh, last week, so there's uh, many different cognitive functions can be assigned to uh, the same brain structure, and that's 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 the the sort of the one to many mapping, right? So there's one to many mapping between a brain structure and its different cognitive uses, right? So that is by now, uh, fairly well established. Now, when you're trying to identify cognitive homologies, right, um, they're described uh, as one-to-one -one mappings, right? Whether they are one-to-one -one mappings, we don't know. I mean, that's the $5,000 question, but they're described as one-to-one -one mappings between a brain structure or network brain structures and its basic cognitive contribution. Um, now, I say here uh, that it's possible that whatever uh, the description of what the structure uh, is doing, it's possible that uh, it doesn't capture all uh, uh, the, the contribution of the, the structure to all the cognitive uses, uh, the, all the functions in which it participates. Um, so it, that's quite possible. Um, but by, by uh, their nature, the way you define a cognitive homology is a one-to-one -one mapping. So it could at least, at the very least, it reduces uh, the one-to-many mapping to one-to maybe few, uh, uh, who knows. Uh, but I think I find this, uh, this can be quite useful when it comes to uh, mapping uh, functions on, onto the brain. Uh, so so uh, it could be that the, uh, uh, the identification of cognitive homology could be uh, helpful in uh, constructing uh, uh, cognitive ontologies that are useful for uh, the cognitive uh, neurosciences. Uh, so I'm going to leave it at that. I think I'm out of time and uh, we'll be happy to take your, uh, your questions. Thank you very much, Vincent, for this uh, uh, great talk. Uh, if you have a question, please uh, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and just write your name. And I will promote you to the series of panelists so that you can ask a question. And we'll start uh, just now with uh, Shen Pan. Shen, the floor is yours. Shen? Yes. yes. I don't know if you all can hear me. Hi. We can yes. hear you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, thanks for the talk. I just want to ask a very sort of open-ended question about whether um, your account of cognitive homology has anything to say about um, another issue in memory research and comparative psychology, and that is the uh, issue of episodic memory in non-human animals. And I take it part of the reason there is a debate there is that there is this lack of consensus about what episodic memory should be defined and behaviorally operationalized. And that makes it a difficult question to, I guess, figure out exactly what cognitive contributions any structures may make, right? So I just wonder uh, if if you have anything, uh, if you have any thoughts on that. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I'm 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 uh, unfortunately I'm not familiar with that debate, um, but uh, just talking about this more generally, um, I think that uh, yeah, if if uh, if the uh, the very uh, psychological construct, construct, right, of episodic memory, is 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 unclear. Uh, maybe especially in in, in uh, non-human animals. Uh, I, what was the uh, the species you were uh, in birds or birds? Yeah, birds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then then it's very hard to uh, reconstruct uh, what is the specific or, or, or basic contribution of any of the. Uh, of the areas that are involved, any of the structures that are sort of contributing to to, to that, um, yeah. So that's it. I mean, I I don't have much to to offer here uh, in that case. I wish I knew more about the uh, the, the 
but I, yeah, I think that's a that's a good uh, a good point that it would be difficult to uh, uh, to fi to figure out what the basic contribution is in that case. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Very much, Adina. Thanks. That was a, a really interesting talk, um, and I very much appreciate the, um, the the sort of suggestion that paying attention to evolutionary biology is an important thing. I mean, that was also from uh, Chisek's talk last week. And yeah. however, I I guess I worry that figuring out what workings are is essentially exactly the same problem. Uh, as the problem of cognitive ontology. That is, it, it's obscured to me exactly when you know you're getting the right working. And especially if you give up on this one-to-one -one notion at the end of things, um, then how do you know whether it's a shared working or whether you're already differentiating between functions, right? Like, like um, you might wonder whether, well, the language part of what humans do is not subsumed under uh, what humans and monkeys both do, but it's a totally different working, uh, not a homologous working. So I, I was wondering if you had thought about that. Yeah, well, for, for one thing, I sort of underplayed it at the end. Uh, I, I, I'm not giving up on the one to one. I think it's, it's, it's like it's possible. I just want to, uh, there are other views uh, out there that, that sort of challenge this. And my, Michael Anderson has a, a, a sort of a, a different view uh, in, in his book where, uh, yes, you could have uh, different circuits and different mechanisms within uh, these uh, two areas, Broca's region. And when you're speaking, uh, when you use language, uh, it's different circuits that are doing the work than when a monkey is manipulating a, a, an object. Now, it is a possibility, but there's no evidence for this. I mean, what's more likely, I think, uh, and and uh, a part of the job is done when um, people like Petridis and Pandya, they try to move away from a domain specific specification of what the area does to a more domain neutral or domain general. You're already doing quite a bit of work here because you're describing what the contribution is at a level that can be applied to many different domains. So that work, I take it, is already the beginning of trying to, uh, 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 you know, build different ways of talking about that activity, and that would eventually uh, lead to uh, uh, different descriptions, so different cognitive ontology, different words, different concepts. Uh, now, um, of course, uh, nobody knows exactly what's going on in Area Forty Four. Uh, people, uh, their common proposal is that there's some sort of hierarchical processing. Um, so in the last 10, 15 years, a lot of people have thought that. Um, but of course, it's, 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 you know, it's an open question. Uh, I think that would make perfect sense if uh, whatever uh, some million years ago uh, in the common ancestors between, let's say, us and macaque monkeys, I think it would make perfect sense if whatever that area was doing for that creature, uh, it's still doing pretty much the same thing in us and in macaque monkeys, um, but it's doing it uh, a lot better maybe for us. Uh, and so that's one reason why we can talk and the monkeys can't. But if you think about uh, the, the, the fundamental uh, contribution of, of, of the region, um, it could very well be that it's, 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 uh, it's the same. The same thing, at least when described at, at, at a certain level. Um, why multiply, I mean, my sort of approach is why multiply mechanisms and, and, and functions uh, if you can uh, uh, explain uh, uh, many different uses with one bullet. Uh, does that make sense? Or? It, it makes sense, but I'm, but I'm not sure that I, that the worry that we have the wrong ontology or the worry that, um, you know, sort of our, our ways of functionally fractionating things are just sort of off base. I'm not sure that it allays it that much. Um, I, see. I mean, I do think that it's very helpful to look at what, um, 
homologous you know areas do in other creatures to to help us uh sort of pin down things but given the fact that there's also you know a lot of functional evolution and diversity between the creatures that we're talking about um it seems like there's not a principled way that i see for determining when you're when you've moved out of the working you were thinking about into a different working because i don't really know what a working is i guess that's maybe what the fundamental question is but we have a bunch of people lined up with questions so okay. we turn it over good good uh joe you're the next one uh, we only have maybe five six maybe seven minute maximum so keep it short as three people joe and the vessel, could you just uh, uh, switch the screen, share screen function? Oh, okay, I think this works now. Yeah, Joe, go ahead. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Um, I, I think I had another version of Adina's question. Um, so I too was wondering what the sort of evolutionary functional description really gains us in terms of explanation, even though I think it might be interesting in a context of discovery. So if I take something like the fusiform face area, right, um, I can distinguish in the literature, something like a distinction between workings and uses. So, um, and I'm an expertise literature fan. So I think the FFA is yeah. not, not only used to process faces, yeah. but also chess boards, birds, if you're a birder, et cetera, right? And so I would say that, you know, the fusiform face area seems to have some kind of computational working picked out by configural processing. So there seems to be some kind of algorithm that it allows for vision, and then it is used to recognize faces and to become expert members of uh, you know, visual categorization, um, yeah. right? And so I think that there is an interesting further question, you know, I think so, I think Ken Wisher and other people could come back and say, well, the FFA, you know, has this um, working or possesses this working uh, because it was selected for processing conspecific faces, right? So the evolutionary hypothesis mm -hmm. seems, you know, plausible to me, but I'm not sure sort of once you can distinguish between something like computation and working and something like uses or tasks, um, sort of why, why at that point the evolutionary function has some kind of yeah. status. Well, I'm, I'm going to try to answer it this way. I'm quite familiar with the, the, that literature on the FFA and expertise. And uh, so um, now uh, th it's still a debate whether it, it is domain specific. Ken Witcher wants to, you know, there's a debate with Isabelle Gauthier about whether it is, it, it is, it isn't, it's for expertise, it's not just for faces. Um, but I mean, one one plausible uh, story, uh, and there's quite a bit of evidence for it, um, is that uh, look, uh, the other species have uh, uh, FFA, right? We call it the the, the fusiform uh, uh, gyrus, uh, part of the fusiform gyrus, um, and uh, initially uh, it wasn't uh, maybe uh, selected for faces. Uh, it was selected for uh, disambiguating some uh, uh, images or scenes in, that are sort of similar uh, within a certain category. That's certainly one option that's out there uh, in the literature. And then, of course, uh, you're you're going to use it to to process faces uh, if it if it works really well for that, because all faces are very similar in some sense, right? So you need to be an expert at recognizing faces. Um, so I mean. Um, so one way is to think of the, the proper domain of processing of the FFA to be faces. But another way is to think, look, uh, it, it, its contribution uh, may be the same when it comes to cars or birds, if you're an expert at, at such things, and it, uh, as it is in, in uh, recognizing human faces. Uh, and so trying to figure out what that basic cognitive contribution is, I think, uh, uh, it would be, uh, I mean, uh, that could lead to interesting hypothesis that could explain why is it that the area lights up, not just for faces, but for uh, buildings and, and cars and whatnot. Does that make sense or? Yeah, know? great. So you think a kind of phylogenetic analysis could help carve out that space or something? Well, that yeah, and you can, you can study it in different animals. And, but once, you, you're, you're, once you're tied to a structure, I mean, the whole, point about cognitive homology, what I find interesting is that, you, you know, the brain is already carved up in a way. Evolution carved up a brain and there are structures. Uh, I'm not saying that psychology will map beautifully, just neatly onto the brain, 
But once you have a network of structures like the one I presented uh, with Broca's region and the two uh, streams, once you have a structure that is there in different primates and it appears to be doing the same thing, uh, then, then it's a good point to start, you know, carving up something, right? Uh, so I find the, the, the anatomy uh, uh, interesting in this sense of, you know, leading uh, the work of, 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 of conceptual conceptualization at the psychological level. All right, we, we, we leave it at that. Uh, okay. Marco, no, well, is there, I think we have a one time for one or two quick questions. Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Now, I will try, uh, first, thank you for your talk. I'm quite a fan of your work, but I've got a question which is pretty broad and it might be about all the, all the talks we will do. We speak about cognitive ontology. We sometimes speak about one-to-many or one-to-one -one or many-to-many -many mapping. And we always focus on the cognitive part of that mapping using the brain to color the mind. But the point is, if we listen to the uh, mechanistic literature, I've seen William Bechtel between that and these. Now it says, and Craver says, that uh, when we want to draw the boundaries of a mechanism, when we want to define the oneness of some structure, we do that by means of some function, of some phenomenon that we want to explain. When you talk mm -hmm. about Broca's area and we, you, you, you give for granted that this is one area that we want to, to, to map with one or many functions, the oneness of the Broca's area, which we always often take for granted as uh, something simple and given, is all but given because it, the oneness of Broca's area has been defined by Paul Broca because of one, uh, not mm. of one working, yeah. or what, yeah. what one use, okay? And yeah. now yeah. we are trying perhaps to build on that uh, uh, functionally, behaviorally functionally defined structure and try to see if that's reused. But the very way in which we carve structure is not purely neuroanatomical. It's very yeah. far from being yeah. purely yeah. So what about this oneness? Why don't we often reflect about this? Yeah, yeah no, I, that's a very good point. Uh, uh, both the metaphysics of the functional attributions and where the functions come from, uh, that, that's, a, that's a huge topic. Uh, I, 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 um, I don't want to elaborate too much here, but the, I take the point. Uh, these are these are these are very good points. It's it it you got to look at how is it that we uh, you know ended up you know singling Broca's area as such a this unique thing, right? Uh, and the and the mapping the mapping is. I mean, I'm trying to stay away from functional talk. I use basic cognitive contribution. I'm trying to move away from from the standard functional concepts. Uh, but thank you for for your comment question. We leave it at uh, Brian. You have a uh, one minute. Go for it. <laughs> uh, thank you. And yeah, I think mine could be pretty quick. And in the talk, which was really great, you're focused on the topics of homology, and I, it reminds me a lot of the discussion that uh, Polger and Shapiro and others have been having about multiple realizability, hmm. particularly looking at comparative evidence. And I like those chapters of their book. But I'm curious whether. Uh, you have a case similar to, or that can play the same sort of role as your Broca's area case, but on the side of analogy, right? Is there an, is there mm. a case of convergent evolution that yeah. you see the same function but being carried out in something that you think is clearly different? Because I mean, part of what Polger and Shapiro push on is yeah. they want to push back on the idea that even though things might have distant phylogenetic relationships, uh, they might nonetheless we might want to describe those areas structurally as the same even though they come from very different uh, uh, parts of the phylogenetic tree. So is there an example that you like for analogy as yeah. opposed to analogy? Well, I, the, I mean, there's lots of examples in the sort of, uh, in terms of body parts and uh, the physiology, but uh, uh, the wings and stuff, but, um, uh, or the eyes, but um, now in the case of brain, that's very interesting. Uh, now what I, so I don't have an example, but what I can think of very quickly is just, I mean, when I think of the sort of, the, Think about the fundamental basic mechanisms of neural computation, whatever is happening in the brain, that's right? in the cortex. Well, it's, you know, it's quite likely that those mechanisms are, are, are pretty much the same in the visual cortex or in the frontal or whatnot. I consider this as an interesting hypothesis that you're going to have many of the same mechanisms. 
So for me, that makes it quite likely that there's going to be convergence in uh, uh, the one uh, uh, convergence in the way you uh, you mentioned it, so that you're going to have analogous uh, analogies instead of homologies. Uh, but I don't have a specific example. If you have one, I would love to, 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 to please send it to me. And if I can find one, I'll send it to you. Uh, but that's a very good point. I'll have to I'll have to include that for uh, for my next uh, my next talk. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. And we, we're running on you a little bit late. Uh, Adina will introduce Javier, and then Javier will uh, uh, take it from there. Uh, so Javier Gomez Lavin is the provost postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania, and he works in the Department of Philosophy um, and collaborates with Lisa Meraki. Um, he did his PhD in at the CUNY Graduate Center, uh, and got his degree a few years ago. Uh, his interests include uh, figuring out how findings from neuroscience and psychology can address traditional problems in the philosophy of mind, such as consciousness and the role of deliberation. And he also explores how these features of our psychology shape and are shaped by group membership and cultural factors. So he's, uh, he's joining us today with a talk entitled Productive Pessimism and New Ontologies of Cognition. And let me just remind everybody uh, before we move on to Javier's talk um, that this is the last session in the series that's going to be held on a Monday. After that, the sessions are going to be Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. Okay, thanks for joining us and uh, take it away, Javier. All right, thank y'all. Can y'all hear me? Can I get a yes or no? Can I? Yes. Perfect, yes. super. Okay, so we have a lot to talk about. I'm really excited to share this work. I really wish it were in person. You know, I grew up in Pittsburgh, so I kind of was looking forward to coming back. I have a lot of topics to cover and I'm gonna have to breeze through some of the things because the argument I'm gonna make, which is actually a good foil against what we heard from Vincent, is a pretty radical conclusion. It's basically saying like we're in the middle ages when we come to cognitive ontology. <laughs> um, and no amount of looking at monkeys is really gonna help until we sort our concepts out. But good news is if you wanna hear more, I am on the market for what it's worth and I'm open to offers. I'm really open to offers. So if you wanna hear me talk about this for the next three, four, five, ten 10 years, um, go ahead and uh, reach out and I'll be happy to do that. So without further ado, what are we talking about? We're talking about productive pessimism, which is a little phrase I want to kind of start motivating the literature and ontologies of cognition. And then of course, kind of highlights its foil, which is that there might be a kind of optimism about cognition. And I do think that we can see these narratives play out in the history of neuroscience and neuropsychology. And because of the length of the talk, I'm going to be a little breezy when I use psychology, neuroscience, cognitive science, cognition, et cetera. We could talk about, I mean, there are distinctions there. But I do think the, the narrative of optimism has kind of won out. And there's some lessons in the kind of pessimistic dark horse that stalked neuroscience for, this entire, for the entire time it's been around that we need to pull from. So there are a lot of people to choose from for an optimistic narrative. I mean, one I think of is Horace Barlow, right? He unfortunately passed away this year, British vision neuroscientist related to Darwin. Um, and in the 70s, and here I'm quoting from David Marr, he actually had this dogma, right? And the first dogma, and I'll just read part of the quote here, is that a description of activity of a single nerve cell, which is transmitted to and influences other nerve cells and of nerve cells response to such influences from other cells, is a complete enough description for a functional understanding of the nervous system. And you know, in neuroscience and go fire artificial intelligence in the 70s were awesome. Everybody thought it would be solved in 10, 15 years. And that quickly became, you know, a little bit optimistic <laughs> and kind of, we can trace this, right? So think about it, you know, 10 years ago, people got, scientists got billions of dollars to do this human mapping project. Um, and of course, you know, it was supposed to be a 10 year clock and it, well, we haven't gotten a map yet, um, which isn't to say we shouldn't try. It's just that, you know, maybe we should consider some of the other uh, uh, possibilities. And what is that other possibility? Well, there's this competing narrative I wanna draw out in the history. And that's a kind of pessimism. And again, I'm gonna be sampling from cognition and neuroscience here. And I think uh, one of the people, and these are like a, a group of my imperfect heroes, if you will, uh, that embodies this, and I think got much maligned because of his weird Darwinian uh, problems, was Jerry, Jerry Fodor. And I, this is actually a copy of my version of modularity mine or a photo from my version. And I, you know, I'll just quote it, right? It's this much maligned Fodor's first law. So it goes something like this. Fodor's first law of the non-existence of cognitive science 
is that the more global, for example, the more isotropic a cognitive process is, the less anybody understands it. Very global processes like analogical reasoning aren't understood at all, more about such matters. Da, da, da. And you see, I wrote like pessimism right there. And I think, you know, people throw this away, but I think, especially if we approach it epistemically, there's some computationally, there's some really big problems if you think that a theory of cognition is supposed to give you uh, some kind of grasp on these really computationally extravagant properties of like globality, domain generality, flexibility, compositionality, systematicity, that's what it talks about. And, you know, arguably you can see kind of certain trends of this pessimism in neuroscience. So when I was in Berlin, I had the fortune of hanging out with John Dylan Hayes and he's written a lot of really good primers on advances in neuroimaging, including multi-voxel pattern analyses. So I'm just gonna quote from a section here. And in it, he kind of describes some of the computational challenge with doing this pattern recognition. And it seems obvious, but you know, working through it is important. So he's talking about image reconstruction here. We don't have to get into the details, but I just want to quote here. So image reconstruction refers to the attempt at decoding arbitrary images from brain signals. To understand the scope of this, the challenge poses, it can help first to first dramatically simplify the problem and consider random images of a 10 by 10 black and white square. The task of reconstructing an arbitrary pattern of 10 by 10 black and white squares that a person is viewing might seem easy, but it constitutes a formidable challenge. The number of potential black and white images is two to the hundred. Even a, a brain response for each image could be measured in one second. It would take more time than the entire length of the universe to actually sample that, right? So doing a kind of strict causal interventionist narrative, right? When you're dealing with stimuli, which are a lot and brain, uh, uh, patterns of activity, which are a lot, is really hard, right? <laughs> and what's really interesting and what I love, and I've been doing, I've been spending way too much time doing, is looking at historical precedents for this kind of optimism, pessimism narrative in cognitive science. And of course, we have these two uh, figures. One on the left is very well known, of course, is William James. And it's really interesting because in the last section of his volume and chapter on memory, he actually disses this other psychologist, William Thornburg Ladd, who had written his own principles of psychology three years earlier. And he was a Kantian psychologist. So, you know, not everybody's perfect. Again, he's an imperfect hero. And he was uh, writing in a kind of very pessimistic tradition that I think, you know, James kind of was a much better writer and just dismissed it. And I think maybe unduly so. So I'm going to kind of give you some quotations from Ladd's work that echo what we just saw the modern people saying and kind of foreshadow some of the conclusions I'm gonna make. So here's one from his principles and figure out if you can tell who this sounds like. It's not easy to predict how far psychophysical science will be able to push its discoveries in the future or just where it will meet those insuperable barriers which surround all fields of human inquiry. It's perfectly safe, however, to affirm of all the phenomena of so-called higher faculties of mind, what Monsieur Rabot says of the study of abstract concepts, that they still fall outside the province of psycho physiological psychology. Certain difficulties are so obviously intrinsic and essential to the very nature of the facts with which the science attempts to deal when approaching these faculties that we cannot see how they will ever be successfully met. The foregoing conclusions apply most obviously to the formation of abstract concepts, the conducting of trains of reasoning, the exercise of choice and the activities of the creative imagination and artistic production, scientific discovery and mechanical invention. I mean, it's very foodery. I mean, for the wrong reasons, because he's a Kantian. So, you know, you can't always be right, but he's hinting at this like, hey, you're not gonna get a physiological story of how we decide things. You know, this is, there's a mismatch here. Furthermore, here's another little quote. All calculations as to the possibility of representing all the individual ideas and images of memory by one or more nerve cells or nerve fibers each, we regard as wholly useless, whether the number of nerve cells in the cerebrum be as minor, calculate 600 million, which is a little low, <laughs> or even many more as Beale supposes, everything which psychology teaches as to the character of the mental phenomena and everything which physiology teaches as to the nature of cerebral functions discourages the puerile attempt to connect separate mental images or ideas with isolated nerve cells as their product. So it's not the exact line of inference that, that uh, John Dylan Hayes was making, but he's pointing out this is computationally maybe not the right kind of way to, to go about things. Um, there is not gonna be a grandma cell basically a hundred years before that was fashionable. And here's my favorite, the kind of 
appeals to, and I'll bring back, and it kind of echoes, or I guess it foreshadows some of the conclusions I'm going to make. And he says, the application to mental phenomena of uncouth terms derived from the physical sciences, such as agglutination, agglomeration, cohesion, organic phosphorescence, histiological cataplexy, etc., has simply the effect of repeating certain psychical facts and laws in a less appropriate way without adding an item of information regarding the real nature of their physiological basis. So spoiler alert, that's what I'm going to say working memory does, and that a lot of cognitive scientists, terms in cognitive science do. All right, that's a bit of a historical interlude. Now I'm going to lead for the next third of the discussion to use working memory, which is something I've worked on for way too long, as a kind of model for how cognitive terms can go wrong and how we might yet be able to resuscitate them in some kind of productive way, which is still going to have to be pessimism. So how do we get from pessimism to a productive story? Well, as I kind of already outlined, and this is a shameless plug here, um, I'm going to use working memory. So I recently got a paper published on uh, that, that big paper that really covers way too much ground, but makes the case that if you take even a congenial view of natural kinds, you're not going to come up with a version of the functions and how they're of working memory and how they're realized in the cortex that projects to all the instances that working memory is supposed to explain. In particular, all those robust cognitive processes like consciousness, deliberation, reasoning, et cetera. Um, and in fact, working memory, it's, it's, it doesn't do much. It's explanatorily empty or it's actually pernicious. And I love this because it's got published. And if I ever get a chance to write a book, I'm going to put this as a blurb. I just made so many neuroscientists so mad. And I'm just going to pick one out, anonymized, of course. So this person said, yes, thanks. I understand the argument. Perhaps mine wasn't clear. I disagree. In the lab, working memory may not be used exactly in the way it is in the real world, which I, I don't know what that means. But... But isolating a function is necessary for doing good science. That doesn't make it not a thing. Philosophy, bah. So I don't know about you, but I take that as a, as a point of pride. <laughs> so hopefully I can show why I might be right in that. All right, what's working memory? Okay, for those of you who don't know, I'm gonna kind of pitch you an example here and breeze through the argumentative steps. Imagine back in the before times, before before times, when people like had numbers uh, telephone numbers that you had to write down on pen and paper because you didn't have a computer in your pocket. So they would say, my number is 12128178615. And how would you remember it long enough to find a pen and a piece of paper to write down? Well, oftentimes you would just kind of re rehearse it in your inner speech in sotto voce in your mind over and over and over until you managed to find a piece of paper to write it down. If you didn't do it, then there was a good chance it would just fade from your conscious perception and you would forget the number, right? So it's this kind of intuitive capacity that bridges the recent past to the present. And William James talks about it. And I argue you can find it in basically every account of mental architecture ever. So I think we can even argue that this goes back to Aristotle and his account of Phanacea. And I'm actually working on a, a paper with a colleague, Justin Humphreys, on this problem, arguing that Phanacea is similar to working memory and it's flawed in the same way. But you know, we're gonna play pretend as psychologists here. So we need something that's operationalizable. And fantasy uh, bridges, these aren't, right? So I'm gonna pull out a generic definition, which in the paper I argue for, and which I think matches most kind of intuitive operationalized senses of the term. In that version, working memory is this ability to maintain limited information no longer in the environment for short durations in the service of goal-directed behavior. So it's important for problem solving and you gotta, for, for recipe planning, for linguistic comprehension, everything. Let me just kind of draw that out a bit. So when we look at what's at stake with something like working memory, we can kind of see that people put a lot of, put a lot of onus on it. So here's Alan Baddeley. He's like the grand don of the psychology literature of working memory. And in his book, he kind of <laughs> lays it out pretty clearly. He says, working memory is assumed to be a temporary storage system under attentional control that underpins our capacity for complex thought. So if you're engaged in thinking, you know, in any reasonable, robust way, you're using working memory for everything, planning a recipe, planning a route, figuring out which college to go to, you name it, writing a paper, reading a paper, understanding what I'm saying, it's working memory. And philosophers have kind of jumped on the bandwagon. So here's Peter Carruthers. And if you do have a picture that's unflattering, I will find it. Um, and he actually kind of sums it up really nicely in his book and in his paper before the book. He says, look, 
Many philosophers are committed to the view that the mind has a kind of central workspace where concepts can be freely combined with one another, in which attitudes of all type can become active, engaging with one another in the systems of inference and decision making. And he says, there is indeed such a central workspace in the mind whose contents are additionally always conscious. This is so-called working memory, which has been studied in scientific psychology. So just to give people a picture, we have these properties of robust cognition of a mental workspace of this kind of internal arena, that it is a kind of flexible space. It is domain general. Thoughts can come in from across the mental landscape. You can mix them together. You can mash them together and you can come up with new thoughts or just entertain them and problem solve, et cetera. And this is psychologically realized in working memory. And in turn, philosophers have started to use it to say, support ideas of first order theories of consciousness. So this is, I think most apparent with uh, global work, workspace views such as Dehan and Nakashi views and attention-based views such as Prince. And some could argue that Bloch has a kind of attention-y view uh, and access consciousness, but also for reflective accounts of deliberation. So uh, Carruthers and Aristotle both kind of hold that you have to have the central workspace where thoughts can enter, where sensory thoughts can enter in order to be accounted for by your decision-making faculties. But also in psychology, we see it pop up in dual system models of reasoning. So this is most obvious in uh, Stanovich and Evans and Jen Nagel's work, uh, where they say, look, all the rational kind of cold, cognitive, hard work stuff, the evolutionary late stuff or whatever, that's working memory. <laughs> and whatever's not working memory, that's all type one, right? All right, so what do I do in my paper? Well, I'm just gonna kind of breeze through it because we don't have an hour. But one thing is I show that there's not really a theoretical unity behind working memory. In fact, there's this fragmentation where it goes from a single box to a couple boxes to a bunch of nodes all over the place, right? It's, it's, it's not really clear that there's a theory that wins out, but who cares, you know? I mean, as long as there's some functions we can define, maybe we can get somewhere. But it gets worse. There's not a physiological unity. So when I was a young psychologist in, in college and whatnot, there was a kind of view of working memory that was called the prefrontal dogma. It was this idea that was really uh, promoted by Funahashi's discoveries and codified by Patricia Goldman Rashish in 1995, who did an excellent interlevel investigation of working memory, uniting it from a cellular basis to a behavioral one, that the prefrontal cortex was this lockbox. It was a storage site. It was the thing that allowed you to keep things in mind long enough to do something with them. And without it, you didn't have working memory. And it was like, problem solved, let's move on to the next thing. But in the 2000s, it started to be critiqued, right? So we had some work by Petrides, who we've heard of in the last talk, who basically lesioned the PFC of these monkeys. And surprise, they could still do a lot of these basic working memory tasks. Um, this work was referenced and expanded in Post Brad Postle's manifesto in 2006, where he collates a lot of work showing that the PFC, it helps, but it's not necessary. It's not a necessary condition for working memory task performance. In fact, it looks like as long as you can represent something in the brain, wherever it's represented, there it can be maintained in the service of goal-directed behavior, right? Okay, so not, there's not a physiological unity. And then what I kind of motivate in the paper is this idea that the functions that underlie working memory, particularly this maintenance of information, are just generic features of the brain. They are generic to any computational system that exists over time. And we shouldn't be that surprised that they're realized in everywhere, basically. Like even the retina can maintain information. I mean, just look at a light, get an after image, you're, you're holding information, you know? So we shouldn't be surprised at this, but again, I'm not a scientist. So, so the scientists actually did some good work on this. Chris Fell and John Dylan Hayes at Berlin did a really good piece in trends where they basically found all these regions, they did a big survey of all these regions in the macaque and human cortex that could represent information. And they found which regions were also active during the delay period in work, working memory tests. That is, they were not only creating that representation, but they were holding on to it. So it just looks like a generic property, which evolutionarily kind of makes sense, right? So eventually I get to this dilemma. Uh, where I basically say working memory either just redescribes it, it's a notational variant of cognition, or it's just explanatorily empty and we should study other things instead. So I'm gonna kind of paint that for you and then we'll kind of come back together and figure out what's productive or pessimistic about it. So here's the dilemma. 
there's one side, it's a very broad side, right? So maintenance is all over the brain. It's realized by plenty of systems. Maybe working memory just is kind of the maintenance of information and however that's realized, whatever, you know, you can be autonomous about it, you can be a Fedorian and say, who cares, you know, it's just the maintenance of information. The problem is that again, maintenance is everywhere. You, it's even clear like the retina can do it. And even at different scales, like you could even argue the way that a membrane potential in a neuron works is it's maintaining information through that ion gradient, right? What's worse is that there are tons of mechanisms that realize generic maintenance. And that's not that surprising. And again, we're computational systems that exist over time. Not only does a membrane potential kind of realize uh, maintenance of information, not only does a retina realize maintenance of information, but there's all sorts of systems, including ones that are so-called activity silent, where we, we're pretty damn sure the representation's in somebody's head, but we can't find any neuroimaging data to support it. So we just assume that after doing this, replicating it and doing it with many different techniques, that it just is in some, it's in being encoded in some way that we're not sensitive to, right? So that just seems to be a property of neural systems that they maintain information and that's not too surprising. So the, the, the conclusion here is just that working memory is just, you know, it's about cognition, you know? When you say, hey, the, the thing that's responsible for consciousness is working memory, you're basically saying the brain does it. You know, it's not really that interesting. On the other hand, you could be restrictive, right? You could say working memory is just a narrow subset of tasks that are real working memory tasks. And this is a line that a lot of neuroscientists go down nowadays. They say there's some bona fide working memory tasks and then everything else is not really working memory. And they often call those narrow subset of tasks manipulation tasks. The problem is I don't think there's a, a non post hoc way to describe what manipulation is in cognitive terms. It just seems that they're happy some tasks are manipulation tasks and that's what they call them. The problem is many of those manipulation tasks are themselves tasks that measure things like problem solving or decision making or inference, inferential reasoning or alphabetization or rule following or task switching. And let me tell you what, those are interesting cognitions, right? But why should we assume that an answer to one of those cognitions should generalize to all of the things that we've associated with working memory? In some sense, working memory is empty. Just study those things because they're interesting in themselves. Why do we have to lump them together under this magic black box that somehow explains consciousness, deliberation, and reasoning, right? And in some sense, here I'm just kind of echoing Lad when he's like, just because you come up with a fancy term. And that was a fancy term, by the way. You know, Newell and Simon came up with it in the 50s for their logic machine. And I think uh, the kind of more cognitive leaning psychologists were like, ah, the, the computer people are doing it. Great. We'll just to have working memory in our thing, right? But it doesn't really <laughs> give an explanation, right? So what happened? Well, we don't have time to talk about that, but if you wanna read it, here's my other shameless plug. I think in the history of neuroscience, there's been an obsession with causation and it leads us down these kind of routes when we're dealing with something that really is way too complicated to have an easier good causal story. But worse, I think it goes back to Kant. I think it goes back to this idealized view of a rational agent. And we could talk about that later because I'm running out of time. So where do we go from here? I mean, there's a few options. One thing we could do is do a kind of Fedorian quietism. And I just love this statement because I think it really captures the essence of Fodor, right? So here he was arguing against Pinker and his book. And he says in this one section, this is the entire section. So how does the mind work? I don't know, you don't know, Pinker doesn't know, and I rather suspect such as the current state of the art that God were to tell us we wouldn't understand it. And I think we're close to that, but I think there is, that almost throws away everything. Like why should we throw away 50 years of research and millions and, or not billions of dollars of research on working memory? I think there, scientists aren't just stupid, they're studying something real, it's just not this magic panacea, right? So what is it? Well, I'd argue it's a mosaic-like picture, sorry, Carl, uh, of meso-level constructs. Okay, TM, trade So what's a meso-level construct? Well, just to give you a kind of pair, a toy example, right? So we talked about working memory. I argued that functionally working memory is the maintenance and manipulation of information, though who knows what manipulation is. And I think that what scientists have done, what the, like what the neuroimagers have done, the, the cognitive psychologists have done, is they've actually already captured a lot of these meso-level candidate systems, mechanisms, computational processes that actually do maintain and manipulate information. They just don't do it in a way that generalizes 
to all these cases that philosophers and psychologists are interested to. You know, they, they maintain information, but they do it maybe for a much more narrow purpose, right? And I think if we give a picture of that, we're actually halfway to, well, maybe not halfway, but we're some part of the way to giving a really nice picture of cognition, or at least a map of it. So what are some examples? So again, shameless plug from some of my older work. Uh, for example, interprietal sulcus recruitment might be important for maintaining category labels. The prefrontal cortex might be important for maintaining abstract quantities. Top-down modular vision uh, could be important for distractor mitigation. These are all real ways to maintain information that are now lumped into this kind of very unexplanatory term. Sorry, I know I'm going a little fast, but there's a lot to cover, but we're almost done. So how do you find these meso-level constructs? Well, I have a heuristic that I've been using and it's, it's pretty efficient for me. And I call it the first paragraph rule. What's the first paragraph rule? Well, it basically means you ignore the first paragraph. Let me give you an example here. Here's the fancy paper, Nature Neuroscience, Gazelay, lots of smart people. And the first paragraph, and this is almost always true of almost every working memory paper ever published in psychology, and it's probably a sociological fact, right? That they say something like this. Working memory is the cognitive operation that underlies our ability to temporarily maintain and manipulate attended information in mind when no longer accessible in the environment to guide behavior. And sometimes they put in a quote to Baudelaire or whatever, you know. That's, <laughs> if we already discovered, that, that's just not much, right? That's just this generic, other word for cognition, robust cognition. What are they actually studying? Well, if you go down the page, they actually tell you what they're studying here. So here they're studying working memory performance in the setting of distracting information and how it's associated with top-down modulation of activity in visual cortices. That's a real thing. That's a real mechanism that is important to the maintenance or main of some information. It's not gonna explain every case of working memory, but it doesn't need to. So what do we do with this? Because I can't go through every paper on my own, though if you paid me to do it, <laughs> if you gave me tenure to do that, I'd do it. Well, fortunately, I have a good colleague of mine, Witt Schombein from the University of New Mexico, who actually knows math and such. And what we're doing is creating these little toy cases. So I'm happy to get help from somebody else too. So in this idea, you take a bunch of papers that do working memory that might have these, these kind of latent meso-level concepts. And you put them through some magical machine learning, like LDA or uh, non-negative matrix factorization. And you get these latent possible candidate meso-level constructs. And this, if, if you've been going to the sessions, this might remind you of some work that Russ does, right? It's very similar to, to the work that he's already doing with his amazing lab. But let's take a second here. And I don't mean to be mean about this. I'm gonna just say that th this is good, but there's a reason why we need something slightly different. When we type working memory into the cognitive atlas, what do we get? We get this unreviewed anonymous concept where it's a type of memory, it's part of decision-making, it has all these perceptual qualities. And what's part of working memory? Let's read. Working memory maintenance, working memory updating, maintenance, going all the way down, central executive, who knows what that is, further down, active maintenance. What is active maintenance? How is active maintenance different than maintenance? And, you know, sadly, if we click those, we get into this like little, you know, loop, right, that I've kind of already demonstrated in the paper. So what we need is a much more narrow grain for working memory way to kind of get that crap out, get that first paragraph out and kind of figure out what are these different computationally tractable systems that scientists have already discovered. And how do they map out? How do they compete with each other? How do they tile out? All right. So kind of pulling back. What is pessimistic or productive about this? <laughs> well, pessimism, it comes in this idea that you're not gonna have cognitive categories or you shouldn't expect them to explain super fancy computational properties like flexibility or domain generality or any of these things, right? So you shouldn't explain working memory to, you shouldn't expect working memory to explain central cognition. So what's productive about this? Well, I'd argue that working memory already captures in a kind of, un, you know, in a lumpy way, these many ways that brains already use to maintain and manipulate information. But right now it's, try, it's linked in this weird way to try to explain these things like consciousness when really maintenance and manipulation of information is probably a big part of the story of what it is to be cogn co cognitive system that exists over time. So let's analogize this a little bit, all right? And I'm almost done, I promise. Imagine we had something like perception which is, you know, people assume it's a thing. And 
it has all these things that decompose. It decomposes in all these tools, these areas to study, these paradigms, these tasks, all this rich stuff. But what does perception itself explain, right? If imagine in a world where perception was thought to explain why we see, and that was thought to be a genuine explanation. So people would say, hey, how do we see? Oh, it's perception. And you'd be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Of course, that's, we see that that's a trivial kind of Moliere style uh, reason, pattern of reasoning, but that's what exists in working memory. People token working memory and they're like, they're just like how are we conscious? Oh, working memory, oh yeah. And so <laughs> I think perception, we could actually attack it as a candidate natural kind if it was involved in that kind of explanation of a higher faculty or level. And I call this kind of the explanatory stack in, in other work. So, um, so where do we go with all this, right? And I'm ending pretty soon. And I, I've been really inspired lately by reading about Brahe, Tycho Brahe, the Danish astronomer, one of the last naked eye astronomers, right? Didn't use the telescope. But what he did do is he was able to kind of collate reams and reams and reams and reams and reams of observations and organize them in a system that then made the patterns and made it easy to test hypotheses that led to the kind of Copernican calculations to show the eccentricities of the orbits and later to the Copernican revolution. And I think it, this Brahian ontology or this idea that we're in a Brahian moment in cognitive ontology isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it requires kind of this dueling process, right? It requires admitting to ourselves that cognitive concepts like working memory, they can marshal, collate and organize data. And in fact, that's what we should ask them to do. But they need not necessarily explain these kind of intuitive, internal, introspective, if you want to be Solarzian, because we're at Pittsburgh here, this manifest image of our own mentation that's been with us since Aristotle. We need to free them of that. So anyhow, I've gone on long enough, and I really appreciate everyone listening. So thank you so much. I look forward to the questions. Thanks, Javi. Again, if you have a question, please click on the Q&A button and write your name uh, in the text box. Right. Can you just turn your uh, sharing at this for now, except if someone requires it? Okay. All right. Let me just promote people. When the floor is yours. Hey, Javier, how are you? Good, good. Thanks, thanks for that talk. Um, so I, th I think I agree with the conclusion, but I was wondering about your dilemma. Um, so you had this very generic conception of working memory uh, where it was too broad. And then the other side was it just gets to be overly narrow, it seemed. Yeah, I'm wondering, because it seems like one of the ideas that I found from the discussion in the literature is that it's memory that's used for performance of tasks or uh, for work, I guess that would be one way of thinking about it. So why not have, rather than saying, oh, it's all of cognition, say something like it's maintaining information with a specific goal, namely to use that information to uh, guide your task performance or your behavior generally. Um, obviously, something on the retina, although you could talk about it as maintenance, uh, doesn't have that function, right? It's not used by the individual uh, to guide task performance. So isn't there a narrower uh, conception of working memory that is tied to the idea of work, that it's um, a short-term store that'll do that, that is not quite one horn of your dilemma, but not doesn't collapse to the other sort? And you know, why wouldn't that be adequate as a kind of conception? I mean, so again, I think that it depends on how pernicious your, your, your psychologist is. It's very likely I could conceive of a psychologist who makes you stare at a light and then uses the after image to solve some task, right? So I think that, um, I, I Yeah, but you wouldn't be actively maintaining the after image. In what sense. does it mean to actively maintain though? Especially, uh, here's, of, here's the other the, thing. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, so- Sorry, no, 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 you go ahead, sorry, sorry. No. <laughs> when you, you see, go. especially when you see this, uh, the, 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 the results from this activity silent working memory stuff, right? where it looks like you can 
you don't need to necessarily even have the neural firing going in order to keep something in mind. It can be these short-term calcium kinetics or short-term uh, synaptic potentiations that, that are able to maintain that information in mind. Is that suddenly not active? If active starts to collapse into voluntary, that, and I, it's really interesting because some of the early working memory theorists, they actually said working memory is voluntary. They're like, it's this voluntary capacity. And, and Badele kind of did that and then he shifted very quickly. And I think it's in part because that's kind of the thing it's supposed to explain, again, is how do you get to this kind of voluntary decision-making thing in the first place? And I think you have to, you can't pick and choose. And I, and I think this is probably an unfair position to put a lot of psychologists in because they don't particularly care. They want to figure out how do, how do brain processes work? How do these mesolevel concepts work? And I think it's really when you get into the more theoretical level that the psychologists are saying, okay, let's extrapolate from this to say, this, is this, this must be the same phenomena that's underlying all these other properties. Um, so, uh, you know, to me, it's like, I think, look, it's not surprising working memories everywhere. If it is something like maintenance for task performance, that's what we do in almost every single psychological task. Almost every single psychological task that requires you to read instructions, maintain cubes, maintain rules, it's gonna require working memory in some degree. So it's almost like, it almost should just drop out of the discussion in some sense. Does that make sense? Right, so a text in says, uh... Um, let me invite people to just write their name, but I take the opportunity to follow up on uh, Wen's question and put it in a slightly different uh, manner. So here's one way, the way you're presenting it is that it sounds almost trivial to, uh, to refer to working memory to explain any psychological phenomenon because there will be maintenance of information um, anywhere in cognition. Um, but now one might think that there's, there's ways to make the claim much less trivial. That there's a subset of tasks that depend on the same mechanism. And how would you know that? Well, uh, and rather than being an assumption, that's something you can test. And it is, that's something that has been tested uh, and you know, one might think in some areas successfully by looking at correlation in performances. You look at individual differences uh, uh, across a range of tasks. And what you find out is that the maintenance of information across this task highly correlates with one another. People who are able to maintain information for some tasks are also able to maintain information for other tasks. Now, which set of tasks? Well, it's an empirical question. It's not something to be determined a priori. It's what empirical science is all about. You, know, you find out which set of tasks depends on the same mechanism and if that, if that set of tasks is sufficiently broad and interesting, you've discovered something which is worthwhile and you might want to call that working, working memory. And, and that's what has been, people have been doing that for quite a while. And you know, we, we know that, for example, working memory highly correlates with, uh, with IQ, IQ, uh, IQ measures, right? 0.5, which is a very high correlation in, in this part of psychology and so on and so forth. So what's really wrong with this way of uh, dealing with uh, the construct of working memory. I mean, I think um, not, it's wrong I'm if you want. Exactly. Yeah, I think yeah, it's ahead. wrong if you want something that is actually going to. I think it's wrong if you want this idea that we have a a, a kind of neutral domain general workspace in the brain that we're using in order to to do all the fancy footwork that's necessary of these core cognitive behaviors. So look, you can correlate anything with anything. You can have as many little tasks that do, look, I think that's what it really should be. We should talk about decision-making as its own thing, problem solving as its own thing, language comprehension as its own thing. These things already exist, but why do they have to be lumped together into this superstructure that themselves is not explanatory? They don't have to be lumped. It's an empirical discovery when you do individual defense research that performance across these tasks correlate with one another. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not an a priori assumption. That's something that you learn when you do individual different psychology, that people who are high in IQ are high in tasks that seems to be loading on what psychologists call working memory. And that's something, that's something, you know, that's something that needs to be explained, that you have, you know, you, that you have loading on a single factor. Yeah, so I, I think it could just easily be the opposite. I think it's almost a historical mistake that it was working memory first and not 
uh, general intelligence or I first. I really do think they're, they are testing very similar things. The tasks demand very similar things. They demand you to stare at a screen, look at some stuff, retain it in mind while it's gone and then repeat it. And that's really interesting. And look, people might do that. I don't know, some kind of horrible working condition in China where you have to like stare at a screen and remember things and spit it back out. But in general, if you're saying that that's the capacity that enables you to do language comprehension, problem solving, deliberation, reasoning, consciousness, you name it, you need more evidence than that. And I think that that's, that's the thing I'm trying to disabuse people of is this idea that working memory can be this magic box that solves all these problems because it seems to be implicated in all these robust cognitions. It's implicated in those robust cognitions almost by stipulation because the very tasks that test it are those robust cognitive tasks. So it's not that interesting or informative. And it's especially not interesting or informative if you're trying to appeal to it as this kind of source for the flexibility of cognition, right? For, for, for what enables us to be the kinds of creatures who can think synthetic thoughts the way we do. And I, I just think that that's false. I think what happened is people were, you had a bunch of linguist scholars, you had some people who studied language like Badalay, all these Chomskyans, and they said, wow, you know, language is really productive and systematic and compositional and you can do it in your own head. You have internal speech and look, you can memorize a phone number and there's, you can, you know, so clearly the, your thought must be able to be just as compositional, systematic and productive. But I think that actually hasn't been proven. I think that that's a translational assumption that then got packaged into all, to all the other things that working memory is associated with without proof in a sense. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, any other question? <laughs> I guess uh, I can We are uh, running after three, but we can take one or two other questions if someone has. Ah, yes, there is a hand. Now let me just, all right. Perry, let me just promote you. Please do not use a hand system. Write your name in the QA box. It's easier for me. Perry, the floor is yours. My question is that uh, your, your approach is working from the bottom up here. In other words, get more and more information at, the, at some level, okay? And then you will build on that information and work the way up the ladder to whatever it is, working memory. The issue in what you're advocating is you could wind up with such a mass of data that you'll know more and more about less and less. So <laughs> uh, that, that, that seems to be the, uh, uh, and you'll just be drowning in data. So the issue is what's a proper level of knowledge to deal with this? I, geez, I don't, I mean, I think that's a good question. I just think that we don't really, so I don't know what this is that we would deal with, but I think, let me make it very clear what I'm trying to advocate. I think we are drowning in data. I think we have 50 years of work that psychologists have done and it's often good work and we can't be Fedorian about it. We can't just throw it away. And what we do is we actually, we realize that not, none of, no single person has discovered a mechanism that is useful in every single thing that working memory has been uh, thought to, to, to participate in. But we already have a ton of different ways that are outlined of how we maintain and manipulate information in the human brain. And I'm trying to argue that maintenance and manipulation, the reason why working memory seems to be so ubiquitous is because maintenance and ma manipulation is ubiquitous. It's, it's actually some of the, the grammar of cognition. And so if we get a picture of that, we actually might have a much more explanatory view of how cognitive cognition works. And so I think we're already there. We just need some people who know how to do machine learning <laughs> to get started. Thank you though. You're muted, Edward. Months of Zoom and still making a beginner mistake. <laughs> Uh, uh, I was saying, since uh, we've already passed uh, time and there is no uh, other question, we will uh, stop here. I'd like to thank our two speakers today, Vincent and Ravir, for their uh, really excellent talks. It's been really uh, a wonderful uh, session. And as, 
Adina mentioned earlier, we will see you uh, next week at 10 a.m. Uh, for the next uh, two uh, meetings. Thank you very much all and uh, have, a, have, have a great week. Bye.